Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I am an assistant professor of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Today's topic is introduction to anemia. In this lecture, we will learn about the definition of anemia, the different levels of blood hemoglobin at different ages. We will also learn why there is variation between male and female blood hemoglobin level in certain age groups. We will talk about the common clinical features of anemia, the classification of anemia, and we will finish our discussion by talking briefly about the approach to diagnose anemia. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. First question, how can we define anemia? It can be defined as a reduction of total circulating red cell mass below normal limits. We can also define anemia as a condition where the blood hemoglobin level is below the lower extreme of the normal range for the age and sex of the individual. So we can see that in anemia there is reduction in the total circulating red blood cell mass. And we all know that red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygen throughout our body. So whenever there is reduction in red blood cell mass, there will be reduction in oxygen carrying capacity and that will lead to tissue hypoxia. So now that we have defined anemia, now let's move on and talk about the normal levels of blood hemoglobin at different ages. Now always remember normal blood hemoglobin level depends upon the age and sex of the individual and also on the environment and we will see that there is difference between the level of hemoglobin in male and female in certain age groups and that is due to androgen. Always remember androgen have stimulatory effects on erythropoiesis and androgen level is higher in male compared to female and that's why there will be more erythropoiesis and more hemoglobin in males compared to females in certain age groups. Also remember that in pregnancy the level of hemoglobin can be lowered and that is due to hemodilution. And why is there hemodilution in pregnancy in a pregnant woman? That is due to expansion of plasma volume. Now this phenomenon particularly occurs in the third trimester of pregnancy. So during third trimester there is rise in plasma volume. However, red cell count remains normal. As a result, there is hemodilution and sometimes this is also referred to as spurious or pseudoanemia because the red cell count is normal. However, since there is elevated plasma volume, so it is appearing that the hemoglobin concentration is reduced. Now, this type of spurious or pseudoanemia can also occur in splenomegaly because in splenomegaly there may be pooling of the red blood cells in the spleen. It can also happen in congestive cardiac failure because in congestive cardiac failure there is fluid retention and that also causes hemodilution. So always remember hemoglobin level is higher in adult male compared to adult female due to increased amount of androgen that promotes erythropoiesis and hemoglobin level appears lower during pregnancy due to hemodilution. Now let's talk briefly about grading of anemia. Always remember when blood hemoglobin level is less than 7 gram per deciliter that is considered severe anemia. When it is between 7 and 10 gram per deciliter that is moderate anemia and when blood hemoglobin level is from lower limit of normal to 10 gram that is considered mild anemia. So what are the common clinical features of anemia? Always remember the clinical features will depend on the degree of anemia and also on the causative disorder. Now since in anemia there is reduction in red cell mass, so there is reduction in oxygen carrying capacity and that's why some clinical features are obvious. So there will be easy fatigability. The patients will become tired easily. There will be effort dyspnea, that is when the patient is performing something strenuous or even 
mildly strenuous, the patient may experience difficulty in breathing. There may be tachycardia, increase in their heart rate, and there will be paler. Recall from your medicine textbooks, we had seen that in those textbooks, anemia is defined as a clinical condition that is characterized by pale coloration of skin and mucous membrane. And the examiner may ask you, what are the sites of examining anemia in a patient? So we will look for paler in the following sites. They are lower palpebral conjunctiva, the dorsal or upper surface of the tongue, palm, sole, nail beds, and also in the skin. So these are the sites of examination of anemia. So now that we have talked about the common clinical features of anemia, now let's move on and talk about the classification of anemia. We can classify anemia in several ways. One way is to classify anemia morphologically. And this morphological classification is based on red cell indices. And we all know that red cell indices include mean corpuscular volume or MCV, mean corpuscular hemoglobin, MCH, and mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. So according to these red cell indices, anemia can be classified in three groups. They are microcytic, hypochromic anemia, normocytic, normochromic anemia, and macrocytic anemia. So what is happening in microcytic hypochromic anemia or microcytic hypochromic anemia? Here, all the red cell indices are decreased. The examples of microcytic hypochromic anemia will include iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia, anemia of chronic disease, and sideroblastic anemia. The next group is called normocytic normochromic anemia. Here, the MCV, MCH, and MCHC are normal. However, the red blood cell count will be reduced and also hemoglobin level therefore will be reduced. And examples will include aplastic anemia, hemolytic anemia, and also anemia in acute hemorrhage. So in these conditions, the red blood cells will have normal size normal stain however their numbers are reduced and that's why the hemoglobin content is reduced leading to anemia so this type of anemia is known as normocytic normochromic anemia the third group is called macrocytic anemia and as the name implies here mean corpuscular volume and mean corpuscular hemoglobin will be increased however there will be normal mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Examples will include megaloblastic anemia as well as certain non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. And causes of megaloblastic anemia as we will later see will include vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiency and non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia causes will include alcoholism. Non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia can also happen in certain liver disease, myelodysplastic syndrome, and hypothyroidism. We can also classify anemia according to etiology and etiological classification will include several causes for example blood loss, impaired red cell production and also anemia due to excessive red cell destruction. So let's talk about the causes in these various groups. Causes of blood loss will include both acute and chronic hemorrhage. Acute hemorrhage can occur during surgery or following certain trauma and chronic hemorrhages can occur in certain chronic cases for example in ulcerative lesion of gastrointestinal tract it may also happen due to certain parasites for example hookworm or ankylostoma duodenali and certain other parasites that can cause chronic blood loss regarding impaired red cell production this can also happen due to several reasons for example, if there is inadequate supply of the essential nutrients that are required for erythropoiesis, there can be development of anemia. So it can happen in iron deficiency, in vitamin B12, folic acid deficiency, and also in protein calorie malnutrition. Now, anemia can also be associated with certain chronic disorders. Causes will include infection, connective tissue disorder, disseminated malignancy, etc. And always remember, in these chronic disorders, there is sufficient amount of iron in our body, but that iron is not allowed to be utilized in production of hemoglobin. So that is anemia associated with chronic disorder. Now, anemia can also occur in certain inherited disorders like thalassemia, 
and hemoglobinopathies and we will talk about these disorders in detail in separate lectures. Anemia can also occur due to bone marrow infiltration by metastatic tumor and the causes will include leukemia, lymphoma, myeloid proliferative disorders, myelodysplastic disorders, etc. Anemia can also occur in renal failure and aplastic anemia. Lastly, anemia can also occur due to excessive red cell destruction and that can be due to intracorpuscular or extracorpuscular defects as we will see in our later lectures. The last topic that we will talk about is regarding approach to evaluating anemia. So we will first do a complete blood count. If the patient has anemia, there will be low hemoglobin concentration. So when we see low hemoglobin concentration in complete blood count or CBC report, we have to look at the other parameters. If we also see associated abnormalities of white blood cells and platelets, for example, if there is also leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, we have to do bone marrow examination because the patient may have aplastic anemia where there is aplasia of the bone marrow or the patient may have myelodysplasia or certain hematological malignancies. Now, if the abnormalities are restricted to red cell series alone, then we have to look in the reticulocyte count. This is very important. Reticulocyte count may be increased or it may not increase according to the degree of anemia. If the reticulocyte count is increased, we have to suspect hemolytic anemia. Always remember, in hemolytic anemia, there is increased rate of destruction of the red blood cells. So immature red blood cells are produced and these immature red blood cells for example, reticulocytes are also seen in the circulation. So in hemolytic anemia, the reticulocyte count is raised. However, if the reticulocyte count is not raised according to the degree of anemia, then we also have to look into the red cell indices and we have to decide whether we are dealing with microcytic anemia, normocytic anemia or macrocytic anemia. And then we have to do further investigation according to our clinical features. So this concludes our lecture on introduction to anemia. I hope this lecture was helpful. In our next lecture, we will talk about sideroblastic anemia. If you like my videos, do share, subscribe and let me know. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.